Hello everyone, my name is Carl and you're listening to Filling It In by Bulag Bandit Media. Today I wanted to talk about a really serious topic which I also wrote a post about on my website www.bulagbanditmedia.com about the accessibility of air travel. So today joining me is Ellie and I'm going to let you introduce yourself uh, for the benefit of the episode. My name is Ellie, my pronouns are she, they. I am a blind person um and i have a guide dog i've used a white cane before i got a guide dog and so i know a little bit about ableism that i face day to day i'm on youtube and other social media platforms like tiktok and instagram shameless self-plug no worries no worries (laughs) and i think that's really awesome because uh, the world really needs to know about these stories and i didn't really see anything in in normal news media for context I'm, i'm a journalism major and I try to emphasize putting the right stories out and highlighting the correct stories. But obviously, sometimes or oftentimes, really, the ones that I think should get attention don't. And when we have to read media and watch media as, as a part of our curricula, that now that I pay attention to it, it's so apparent that they, don't, they aren't doing justice to the level that I think they should be doing. Speaking of the media, so this article and this podcast that it's based off of is about, this is a really hard topic to talk about for me, but it's about a disability rights activist who was disabled themselves dying at the hands of United Airlines because of the destruction of their mobility device. I wanted to talk about this because I know that I'm not necessarily that level of disabled, but it's important nonetheless because it highlights something that we go through every day. Maybe not to the same level, but definitely to the same amount of effect on our on our minds and the way that we live our lives yeah i know this is really something that struck me personally because my dad is physically um disabled himself uh he does not use a wheelchair except for when we do travel so uh and when we do travel he does use an electric scooter so this is something that does um It does hit quite close to home because I know, one, how expensive mobility aid devices are, and two, how, when they do get broken, how long you can be stuck without having a replacement. So it's really hard. Excuse me. (laughs) No, you're, you're all good. I really think that's important. The first point you made where you said it's very expensive get these things fixed and repaired you know it's it's a big hassle in the article that i read by newsweek it said that the mobility device that was created for the disability rights activist for um mrs figueroa thirty thousand dollars which is a number that would probably pay off a few semesters of my of my student loans (laughs) like oh my god oh yeah isn't that crazy i I think that's that was obviously crazy oh my god yeah the second point you made that I thought was really important is, you know, just the necessity of it. It's, it's something that you need and being trapped without it would, you know, literally in some cases for some people, like in the case of the article we're talking about, the person died. And for some people, their, their lives would just not be the greatest or possible without their mobility device. Like for me, a few weeks ago, I had my cane break on me. Oh my God. I know that I can sort of get by with my usable vision. So I had to go for about a week and a half because I had to order a cane off of Amazon because Mm -hmm. I live in Hawaii. So if you want anything, it takes about a week on Amazon because we're so far. Those of you who have the privilege of one to do day shipping on the, on the continental United States, or I don't, I think they have it in Canada as well. I'm not really sure, but yeah. That is definitely a privilege and having to live without a mobility device is so difficult. I learned that the hard way. Mm-hmm. Crossing streets, absolute nightmare. Oh my god. Yeah, and and it was so awkward too like walking around and and going to restaurants and having to ask like, "Hey, can I can I like get a physical menu cuz obviously covid is still happening in Hawaii." So, I had to ask for physical menus even though it's kind of not offered and I said I had to lie. I had to say I'm sorry. Um, can I get a physical man? You have bad eyes. I have diabetes. So I know it's a struggle and it's, it's worse for some people, like I said, who are 
more affected by their disability and we just can't we can't have this going on i think it's sad that things like these are still happening what uh, we're 30 years right uh, after the ada yeah. or just about are we over 30 years it's been 31 i think oh yeah so so right over the three decade mark and that was supposed to be the landmark legislation for disability rights right <laughs> Yes, supposed it was supposed to be. It was supposed you know, to be. The signage of granting, you know, blind people public access with their guide dogs and uh, reasonable accommodation being a ramp or an elevator installed, um, braille everywhere, uh, interpreters for people who, with hearing impairments. So, you know, all the titles of the ADA. I think it's really sad, right? Because... ADA was supposed to be legislation. Oh, yeah, we're giving people RAMs, we're giving people Braille, we're giving people interpreters, which is, you know, those are all good things, but not nearly enough, right? Right. As we're seeing. Right. Considering what um, everyone who was a part of the 504 sit ins, what they went through in order to get it. And if uh, a documentary that I really watch, which I think we've talked about before, is Crip Camp. It's about um, mm -hmm. a camp that was for uh, people with disabilities, mainly for wheelchair users. Um, and they were talking about how ha by having a camp for people with disabilities, they were able to see, hey, one, we're not alone. Two, we, there needs to be so much more done in making things accessible. So let's sit in, in Berkeley and let's starve ourselves. Let's, you know, let's stay in the, the Ed Roberts area. Uh, which it's named after Ed Roberts area. I know is named after someone who is a part of the protest, Ed Roberts. Um, but you know, then that led to the signage of the ADA. Thirty years later, we have a disabled rights activist die because of inaccessibility. We shouldn't be having a conversation about whether or not we should give people rights. We should just give people rights because it's what we're supposed to be doing as as like decent, good human beings. <laughs> And it's really sad that we're going through stuff like this because it's such a, it sounds like such a common sense proposition, but obviously mm -hmm. common sense isn't so common, right? Right. You would think that wanting to give people rights would be a given rather than one you have to pursue. It, it shouldn't be like a side activity, extracurricular thing that we do. Oh yeah. So I, I do X, Y, and Z and like on the side, I fight for rights. Like. That's not how this should be working. Rights should just be granted because they're rights. <laughs> and yeah, I think really important point you made here is uh, the 504 sit-ins. To my knowledge, uh, wasn't the Black Panther Party involved in that? I, I think I read something somewhere that they they like cooked for them or like brought food. Yeah, I believe that they were there helping out, giving um, waters and stuff during yeah. that, since they were um, a lot of them were starving themselves as uh, they were doing hunger strikes while doing the sit-ins. And yeah, yeah, those very cool. Thank you, thank you, Black Panther Party. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and it, I just think that that gets left out of history. So I wanted to just bring that up. Um, I know it's really important. I, I I heard that actually, I think in a podcast. Um, about how disability justice is part of the abolition of prisons. Uh, so very important topic that I just want to give a shout out to because I know it's so, so deeply needed. Um, but another thing that you mentioned there that was really important. Oh my gosh, it, it's so hard for me to you know say this, but we're at a point where who knows? People are dying, like you said. What are we going to do to move forward? And what do you think about uh, what should we be doing? Um, yeah, no, this is a super, it's it's a heavy question because us as disabled people, we're like, yeah, we need this and this, but our voices can only do so much and disabilities range from cognitive to physical to visual or um, even, you know, straight up to, to medical conditions and let alone certain accommodations like service animals. Which is, you know, I mean, the two recognized service animals are guide dogs, or not not just guide dogs, sorry, service dogs, and miniature horses. Those are the two only recognized service animals under the ADA. So, I, I know we only have service animals there, but, like, you know, I'm blind, but, you know, someone next to me could be in a wheelchair. How do we, so, for example, with the plane, um... 
how do we make it accessible for a wheelchair user, but then also make it accessible for me as a blind person with a service dog? Why don't we have planes run sort of like buses where we have like priority seating? I think before the episode, you mentioned there was supposed to be some kind of thing where you're supposed to have the front area reserved for people with disabilities. Is that is that to my correct recollection? Yeah, right. So um, before you um, board a plane, there's always pre-boarding for those with disabilities or who need extra time boarding planes. So I always take advantage of that just so I can steal the bulkhead seating for my dog and I so he can be kenneled at the front of the plane uh, just because I like leg room and I don't want to be squished with a dog <laughs> in a, a row. But um, for wheelchair users, they're Hair, if it folds, I believe can go in the bulkhead, but if not, it has to be stored and they have to transfer um, onto a rental from the airport onto to go down the gangway and then be transferred onto the plane. Yep, that's exactly right. And that actually connects to something that's very interesting that I want to get into before I make the first comment regarding uh, the space for your, your dog and the wheelchair. So I have a similar experience which is with canes. So for those of you who are aware, there are canes that fold and there's also canes that don't fold. When you bring a bunch of blind people onto a plane, <laughs> what do you do with people with straight white canes? Put them along the aisle, I would assume. That's what I would assume as well. But the flight attendants on the airline that I flew on that happened to be in a group, I had to be, I happened to be in a group with people who had straight white canes they were at a loss for words and didn't know what to do. Of course, oh, they, no. of course, they were very apologetic and you know tried to work with us on the issue. And I, I'm, I'm grateful that they asked us questions and to see like what we needed and to see how we could work it out. But I know that in every situation we can't have that. You know, humans are imperfect, and I know um, the regulations help with that. If we have some kind of built-in procedure and moving forward, and I want to see as a as a as a jump-off point in just a second to see if there's something we can do. Physically, in terms of design, to build accessibility into the design of aircraft and um, cabins. But the second part you brought up there is you have to store the stuff under the plane if you if it's not compliant with FAA regulations. But my issue here is that's the whole reason why the situation happened. The 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 article that we're talking about that that person died because they put her wheelchair into the cargo hold but it broke so obviously we shouldn't be doing that or we should have some kind of better plan right right and what's really sad is i've seen how they store pet animals within the crates down in um in the the cargo holds of planes and they don't look nearly secure enough in there because they just have one strap over the crate and then they're in like this little Spot with some netting so if the crate moves around the other way the netting can at least catch it and there's a live animal in there imagine how scary you know that is for for an animal that doesn't know anything and so if the animal is a possibility of moving around when it should be secure and should be stable enough to not harm it imagine what's going to happen to a wheelchair that they probably don't know how to put the brakes on especially if it's specially constructed like that and that's why I think part of it, because like you said, they may not know how to use it. There should be a level of like FAA regulation or compliance for all of these things so that when they're designed, they're designed with at least the knowledge that their, their mobility devices, they're designed for you to move. And a, a synonym for the word moving is to travel. <laughs> they should be designed for you to be able to use it when you travel, be FAA compliant. Obviously, that's not what's happening now. And I think that's part of the problem. And another thing that you mentioned there is the treatment of animals. It's notoriously known that airlines have a bad track record with animals. I believe same airline, United, they, they killed a dog on the way to Japan, I believe. They, they, it, it, was the, it was the story in the news where they actually put a dog inside of the upper compartment in the cabin of the airplane. The, the overhead storage? Yeah, so they, they oh. shut the door... So obviously, if it's a if it's a sealed compartment, um, oxygen is limited, right, to what's stored in there. So obviously, no oxygen um, in there. You know they can't breathe. Yeah, that's why I think overall airlines are 
Thailand are really responsible for a lot of like faux pas or just really disrespectful, negative things. I, I don't want to be very, you know, aggressive about it, but it's it's true, right? Like even that, that just breaks your heart, right? I mean, it's, it's yeah. an animal, it's a living being, and no. it doesn't just stop at the animals. It's it it start it's it's going now to the people, it's to the human beings. So many different scandals and controversies, and it's it's <laughs> sadly. I feel like it's centered a lot on United, but I know that it's not just a United problem, right? So it's, it's a oh. industry wide issue, correct? Right. No, it's it's Spirit, it's Southwest, it's Alaska, it's all it's all of them. Let me just say though, Southwest, thank you for at least making things accessible in the in the in the terms of it's cheap. <laughs> Oh my gosh, yeah. No, we use Southwest. We do use Southwest in my house too. Um, and especially since uh, two of my siblings went to the uni University of Hawaii, di different campuses, but um, we would try to go out and visit them or fly them home for the holidays. Southwest is the best when it comes to it. This is not a promotion, but definitely. Yeah, not a promotion. I, I will say, I, I, I think a base move that Southwest made was, um, I think, following the, the Dr. Dao incident, the one where United, oh my gosh, I don't know why it's always United, but United pulled the doctor off the airplane. He had like the bloody face. The police came. I think it was in Chicago. Remember that? A couple of years yeah. ago, there's a huge fallout. But yeah, no, after that, CEO of um, Southwest came out and said that they would no longer overbook flights. Mm -hmm. Come on, guys. I feel like that should be an industry-wide regulation. <laughs> speaking of regulation, actually, we're speaking of you know how this affects humans and how the airline industry is just kind of predatory. The airline industry in America has been deregulated for the last, I don't know, 40, 50 years. Yeah, seven, 1978 would almost be 50 years. So 40 something years, wow. right? Just about. Wow. Yeah, no, that doesn't. Yeah, that's interesting when you think of how um, inaccessible it's been with, you know, ADA and everything. It's, it's really weird because, right? ADA is supposed to be the thing that unifies disability rights and you know, makes it an easier process. But then now you have this deregulation of the airlines. So there's a contradiction where like you have regulations, but you also don't. So it puts this really weird gray area on like, what can we do? What can we regulate? What can we not? And because of that, you end up with situations like this. I also think that it's really bad that airlines can do this thing where, um, have you heard of the... the contract with carriage so basically it's like a contract between the passenger and the airline but usually contracts of carriage are different between airlines i mean hell i didn't even know that if you book a basic economy ticket on united in the contract of carriage that you can't bring two carry-ons and the thing that you bring on the plane has to be a certain size like i was i was flabbergasted when i flew to, to washington this year oh yeah right isn't that Wait, weird so it's a was the contract of bag size? Because I know every company will has different requirements. Yeah, so every 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 airline has its different requirements. But part of their contract of carriage is that if you book a basic airline, basic economy airline seat, because there's economy, but they added this new thing called basic economy, where they put really stringent um, agreements to your your passenger ship. So you don't get to choose your seat because um, usually. Right. If you have a regular economy ticket, I think you can choose what seat you're in in economy. So you can choose like aisle, you can choose bulkhead. And then the other, the other part is you can't bring a full size carry on. So you can bring a backpack, but you can't bring one of those like small rectangular ones that's like this big. Oh. I think the other condition to it is it's non transferable, non refundable. And what's the last one? Oh, um, the only way that you can get some of these privileges back is by paying or becoming a member of the credit card program. So we can obviously see that there's a, there's a motive here and it's, it's, it's profit in big red capital letters. Yeah. I mean, haven't you noticed recently, like all the airline seats are getting smaller. Oh my God. I know. And I, you just see, you're, you're like getting closer and closer and closer and closer to everyone around you and the aisles, you can barely fit through them walking down them. Yeah, that was my, um, that's my thing, right? How is yeah. this accessible? Like, I'm already, like, I don't know. I, I'm a, like, I'm, I would say I'm pretty average size. Like, I, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little large in the bottom area. But um, due to my vision, I'm constantly running into things. And it was impossible to have Norte, my guide dog, guide me inside of an aircraft when we flew to L.A. 
um back in august yeah, it's almost it's almost impossible to use a cane too because like obviously the cane procedure you go left to right there's barely any space to go left to right in an airline cabin <laughs> yeah you basically just have to count seats yeah and I, I also don't like the the system that they heavily rely on um if you have a straight cane my experience is that if you have to use the restroom or do anything you have to call the flight attendant um because they take your cane away for the FAA regulations which come on guys we should have like a a locker for canes or something <laughs> please i think that would be very very common right. sense it's just like a 2 foot by two foot thing that we can put canes in or something like that. That'd be really cool. I will for blind people, not all canes are gonna be two foot since uh long not white canes are gonna be um, you know, thirty six inches, fifty six, um six foot maybe. Sorry, I'm not the greatest at math. <laughs> I just no, 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 I just I made up you. a number. <laughs> no, no, I got you, but you know, like there are some really tall blind people that do yeah. not like telescope. Canes or folding canes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to have something, you know, re something reasonable. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, what do you think about having the guide dogs? And what's that? What's the having the guide dog in, like in the airport? What's that experience like? Uh, <laughs> it's it's definitely a lot. It it it's like having a cane with a couple of extra steps through the airport because. Um, one, you have to advocate for yourself saying, Hey, I'm a blind person. I'm going to need assistance going through. And since usually I was, I was, when I traveled with Norte, I was on vacation with my family. We were going to Disneyland. Um, so to bring a service dog on board, you have to fill out a form from the department of transportation, uh, basically saying, this is a service dog. Here's where he was trained from. Here's his vet. He's a guide dog. I'm the owner. Uh, he will not bite anyone. He will not pee on the floor. He will not damage any property. He is a real guide dog. And if he does so, I will get fined and I could face jail time because that would mean he's a fraudulent service dog. Um, and after I sign that and be like, yes, he's a real guide dog. Thank you for asking. I'm very proud of you. Um, we bring that to the airport and you have to have one for your flight to your location and to your flight back if you're going so it's you got to have one for each you can't just have one for round trip didn't know that they don't really tell you about that but life hack um bring two <laughs> or for however Ooh. many planes you're taking i know crazy right so uh we went through uh we checked in uh, and then we went through security um basically going through I can't go through, because they have, you know, the normal metal detector that you can walk through, and then there's one where you have to, like, put your hands up, and then they scan you around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the one that uh, my home airport prefers, and I think most airports do now. Um, and since I have to have my dog guide me, I can't use that one. Um, so we have to go through one where you walk through, and then they have to do a secondary screening, which is they have to test my hands for gun residue or whatever they're testing for um and so during that time not only do i have to fight back the please don't distract him he's a service dog he's a service dog don't distract him um i also have they have to ask me and i have to be very clear he's a service dog and they can't tell me to take off his harness but i can do it a few ways i can choose myself without them prompting me to take off his harness I can let them look at the harness. They, they, in that specific thing, they're allowed to look to see if there's anything on him. Uh, during the airport, I didn't put any uh, like bandanas on him just so they could like see him in general. Um, he doesn't wear a vest. He just has a harness. If there are metal pieces on it in reflection, but it just goes around his chest and then underneath his ribs. And then there's a handle going up to where I grab it since he guides me. And that's how I get the, all the information from him. Um, I chose not to take it off, but there are a few ways that you can do that. Um, and it was pretty, pretty interesting going through security with him just because I was nervous. It was my first time going through. Although they can train you in guide dog training to do that, um, it, it's definitely a lot um, energetically since the TSA workers are just trying to keep you safe. 
Um, and then we we found our gate. Guide dogs, uh, or I guess service dogs, just do not want to relieve in the the pet relief stations because it's fake grass and there's so many smells that it just overwhelms them. Because a friend of mine who also is a service dog handler, her dog refused to relieve in there. So did Norte. Um, and then when they called for pre-boarding, um, I beat all the ladies in line to get bulkhead. Uh, you know, the old ladies shuffling over to get... There was no one in a wheelchair when I was heading towards there uh, to LA, but... I did get a <laughs> some flight attendants who were trying to distract Norte, uh, and I just would inform him he's a service dog. Don't distract him. Please don't hate crime me today. Um, you know the usual. And the flight itself was pretty simple, but um, yeah, I would say the worst part of going uh, through the whole airport experience was people in general who would distract him. Um, mm. because there's not a common knowledge of, you know, the, the inclusion of people with service animals. Um, and, you know, an off little tangent today, my, I was, I was out with my friend Megan who, who has a, a medical alert service dog. And this man just went up to her with her dog in harness while she was relieving him mm -hmm. and started petting her dog. And she kept saying, and she's way nicer than I am about advocating where i'm just like he's a service dog please leave him alone uh she's like oh well i would prefer if you would leave him alone please because he's actually a service dog please don't pet him thank you uh please don't pet him um and i i got really upset over that because this grown man just decided to go over and pet this service dog while he's working wearing a vest that says service dog do not distract um so anyway i just think the worst thing about it is that there's not um it's not hot um that you know people with disabilities exist here's what it's look here's what it looks like and here's how to be inclusive also don't distract service dogs because why would you do that they have a job that they've been trained for just don't just don't go up and randomly pet a dog that you don't know crazy old yeah, man the other thing is too right teach people to not be not it's just more it's just more than telling people this is how this people with disabilities live their life it's also about this is how we should be respectful, right? right? Because there's always this idea of oh, let's you know, let's show this, let's show how we are, who we are, et cetera, et cetera. But to a certain degree, at some point, it turns into a discussion about, which basically becomes like a zoo, right? And yeah, and it's not even just the the service animals; it becomes the people. You know, mm -hmm. you're telling me that story about your your friend, and they're very nice, right? I have a friend. Um, she's visually impaired right really nice person sweet japanese girl you know especially in japan the, the culture around everything is you know you have to be very polite um for those of you learning japanese you might know that with keigo right you have to speak japanese with an attitude and uh i just have to say that uh guide dogs they're they're you know he said guide dogs are canes with extra steps guide dogs are dogs with an attitude <laughs> because they're working and so yeah. they have this little sass with them where they yeah. kind of shimmy their way through like a grocery store like a target where they're like yeah look at me i'm allowed to be in here target please enforce <laughs> your no pet policy look at me oh yeah i'm a guide dog oh you want me to go left here i go <sighs> dogs that hit different but continue my story <laughs> she's very polite and very nice and, and also soft-spoken so i was with them and I, you know i i had at a point as well i'm not very that very much confrontational especially because of the way i am as well my, my culture being filipino like we're, we're taught to be humble or my parents taught me to be humble anyways so we're in this mall we're just having a chat while walking and then somebody just kind of comes up to us and you know oh can we help you and they like immediately touch us you know and it, it and and, oh, the, and no. the way it makes me feel is like damn they're like they're like petting me and kind of, oh, you know, I've had that happen. You know, you know what I mean? Because they, people, you've seen that, you've seen that with dogs, right? Or like, even you have any kind of pet, you bring them into public, and people will just like come up and be like, "Wow, that's so cute," <laughs> right? Oh yeah, yeah. No, I'm a, I'm a cashier at uh, Target. Funny enough, um, and 
I feel like a Disney princess with my animal sidekick. We right. we are at Disneyland right now. We're we're coming up. We're doing autographs and signatures, and I have to be like, oh, friends, let's make sure not to touch him or say hi to him because he has a very special job. It, it's such a hard. It, it is such a hard job on 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 your part and and our part really. <laughs> when people do these things where they they just come up to you and assume that you want to be touched and help, like right. I don't know, I it. That it seemed to look like we were doing fine. <laughs> um, right. And, you know, for me, it was like, I, I, was, I wasn't I was really even that, I guess, aggressive about it. I was just like, sir, please don't touch me. Yeah. But first she's like, oh, uh, can you can you stop touching? I'm like, you know, and I, I just let it happen because, you know, I, I want her to have her voice. But at the same time, I really wanted to just say the same thing. Like, hey, like, don't, don't. Right. right and that's right. more that's more direct. But that's not even that, like, aggressive. It's just saying don't or no. Right, no means no, guys. Come on, or don't means don't as well. And we have to like, we have to realize that sometimes at a certain point, like it's not our job to teach people. Because you know, there, I, I hear this a lot where you know, you know, people with disabilities we have to become X way or we have to fit X mold. And it's like, no, I don't really think so. Like, I think it's good if you are, you know, more power to you. But we we shouldn't have to change ourselves for the faults of other people and the. The misinformation or lack of education on the part of other people, right? Because at the end of the right. day, it, it's their shortcoming for not being educated, for being misinformed, right? So, right. if you're going to if you're going to be bombastic or I guess like you know very very um the way we say it in Filipino is like like abra abra, you know, like just very aggressive about it. More power to you. We need we need people like that. Every every group does. But at the same time, if, if that's not who you are, then don't force it. Then you, you don't have to. We have to just find our own ways to enforce the ways that we want to live in, in a way that's respectful and that works for us. And that's why we're here doing our part in the ways that we can. Because I would love nothing more than to punch somebody who's ableist. <laughs> oh my God, but, tell me about it. But you know, you know, I understand that to a certain extent, that's also not me. Right, I train martial arts, but I don't, I don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't encourage fighting, um, in that sense. Even though sometimes I really wish I could, and that's why we're here, doing it in this way, having a discussion about it, trying to do our part to educate people. At least for me, that's who I am. I like educating people. My parents, they're both teachers, so that's that's my viewpoint on that. <laughs> it's not that I'm I'm trying to become you know, I'm forced somebody to be like this. It, I'm just trying to share my story and sharing perspectives because ultimately when we share our our perspectives and get everyone's perspectives and views together we get closer and closer to the answer because we get to take what's good from everything and you know take away what's bad or what doesn't work what isn't efficient you know really really like the the bruce lee quote and that's actually why i actually have bruce lee as my um my wallpaper right now i'm a computer that that quote really inspires me in terms of we have to find what works and do that. We have to find ways that we can live together, that we can respect each other and take away what doesn't work. I mean, really, it sounds really simplistic, but it's so, so true. Because sometimes the simplest answer is the best, right? Occam's razor. <laughs> um, so I, I really want to thank you for, for joining me today. For everyone else, thank you for watching. Thank you for um, helping us get the word out and and really sitting down to have this education session on disability rights. And I'm just really, really sad to know that people are still dying like this. And I want to honor as, as many of those people as I can, because those are the people that really are on the front lines of these injustices, these hurtful moments, and ultimately the people that have to reckon with these events are their families they themselves and the people that rely on them for friendship or inspiration for education because of course she's a disability rights advocate it, it's so much more than just the one person it's about the societal and community impact that this has and we are part of this world community we definitely play a big role our percentage or number may be small but we're we're great individuals who who achieve great things. That's exactly what you are, and thank you, Ali, for for doing that. It's really important work, and really to sum this all up. I mean, honestly, what what you did kind of showed me that you know maybe there's there's something I can do here.
that really inspired me. So thank you so much. To all the listeners, have a great day. Maraming salamat sa inyo Carl, I just wanted to say thank you so much for having me on your podcast once again and letting me voice my loud opinion and what I say and do. Thank you to everyone who is watching. If you want to follow me, all my social medias are the fake Ellie. All one word. Pretty simple, pretty easy. If you guys want to follow me, I would really appreciate it so you can keep up with my life and my guide dog Norte's life. Thank you again, Carl. And I had a great time. Hey, thanks for watching. Please make sure to like and subscribe to help keep the show going. You can also view more cool content and my blog on my website, www.bulagbanditmedia.com. You can also try following me on Twitter and Instagram at The Bulag Bandit. Please take care out there and have a great day. Maraming salamat.